Open Letter from a Writer to the Military Junta by Rodolfo Walsh, published March 24, 1977. Censorship of the Press, the Persecution of Intellectuals, the Raid on My Home in Tigre, the Murder of Dear Friends, and the Loss of a Daughter Who Died Fighting You are some of the events that compel me to express myself in this clandestine way after having shared my opinion freely as a writer and journalist for nearly 30 years. The first anniversary of this military junta has brought about a year-end review of government operations in the form of official documents and speeches. What you call good decisions are mistakes, what you acknowledge as mistakes are crimes, and what you have left out entirely are disasters. On March 24, 1976, you overthrew a government that you yourselves were a part of, that you helped bring into disrepute as the executioners of its repressive policies, and that was coming to an end given the elections that had been set for just nine months later. From this perspective, what you destroyed was not the temporary mandate of Isabel Martinez, but rather the possibility for a democratic process through which the people might remedy the problems that you have perpetuated and aggravated. Illegitimate since birth, your government could have legitimized itself by reviving the political program that 80% of Argentinians voted for in the 1973 elections, and that continues to be an objective expression of the people's will, the only thing that could possibly be denoted by the national being that you invoke so often. You have gone instead in the completely opposite direction by returning to the ideas and interests of defeated minority groups, the ones who hold back workplace development, exploit the people, and divide the nation. This kind of politics can only prevail temporarily by banning political parties, taking control of unions, silencing the press, and introducing Argentine society to the most profound terror it has ever known. 15,000 missing, 10,000 prisoners, 4,000 dead, tens of thousands in exile, these are the raw numbers of this terror. Since the ordinary jails were filled to the brim, you created virtual concentration camps in the main garrisons of the country, which judges, lawyers, journalists, and international observers are all forbidden to enter. The military secrecy of what goes on inside, which you cite as a requirement for the purpose of investigation, means that the majority of the arrests turn into kidnappings, that in turn allow for torture without limits and execution without trial. More than 7,000 habeas corpus petitions have been denied in the past year. In thousands of other cases of missing people, the petition has not even been presented, either because the people know ahead of time how useless it is, or because they can't find a lawyer who will dare to present it, since the 50 or 60 who did have been kidnapped one by one. This is how you have done away with any limit on torture. Since the prisoner does not exist, there is no way to present him before the judge within 10 days, as stipulated by the law that was respected even at the heights of repression during previous dictatorships. The lack of any time limits has been accompanied by a lack of any limits when it comes to your methods. You have regressed to periods when victims' joints and internal organs were operated on directly, only now you use surgical and pharmacological aids that the old executioners did not have at their disposal. The rack, the drill, skinning alive, and the saw of the medieval inquisition reappear in testimonies alongside the pecana and waterboarding, the blowtorch of today. By succumbing repeatedly to the argument that the end of killing gorillas justifies all your means, you have arrived at a form of absolute, metaphysical torture that is unbounded by time. The original goal of obtaining information has been lost in the disturbed minds of those inflicting the torture. Instead, they have ceded to the impulse to pummel human substance to the point of breaking it and making it lose its dignity, which the executioner has lost, and which you yourselves have lost. The refusal of this junta to publish the names of the prisoners is, moreover, a cover for the systematic execution of hostages in vacant lots in the early morning, all under the pretext of fabricated combat and imaginary escape attempts. Extremists who hand out pamphlets in the countryside, graffiti the sidewalks, or pile ten at a time into vehicles that then burst into flames, these are the stereotypes of a screenplay that was written not to be believed, 
but to buffer against the international reaction to the current executions. Within the country, meanwhile, the screenplay only underscores how intensely the military lashes back in places where there has just been guerrilla activity. 70 people executed after the Federal Security Agency bombing, 55 in response to the blasting of the La Plata Police Department, 30 for the attack on the Ministry of Defense, 40 in the New Year's Massacre following the death of Colonel Castellanos, and 19 after the explosion that destroyed the Suidadela precinct, amount to only a portion of the 1,200 executions in 300 alleged battles where the opposition came out with zero wounded and zero forces killed in action. Many of the hostages are union representatives, intellectuals, relatives of guerrillas, unarmed opponents, or people who just look suspicious. They are recipients of a collective guilt that has no place in a civilized justice system and are incapable of influencing the politics that dictate the events they are being punished for. They are killed to balance the number of casualties according to the foreign, quote, body count doctrine that the SS used in occupied countries and the invaders used in Vietnam. Guerrillas who were wounded or captured in real combat are being killed just to make sure they are dead. This additional piece of evidence was taken from the military's own press releases, which stated that over the course of one year, there were 600 guerrilla deaths and only 10 or 15 wounded, a ratio unheard of even in the bloodiest of conflicts. This suggestion is confirmed by a sampling from a secret news source which showed that between December 18, 1976 and February 3, 1977, over the course of 40 live battles, the armed forces suffered 23 deaths and 40 wounded, and the guerrillas suffered 63 deaths. More than 100 prisoners awaiting their sentence have also been slain in their attempts to escape. Here, too, the official story has been written not to be believed, but rather to show the guerrillas and the political parties that even those who have been acknowledged as prisoners are held on strategic reserve. The Corps commanders use them in retaliation, depending on how the battles are going, if a lesson can be learned, if the mood strikes them. That is how General Benjamin Menendez, commander of the 3rd Army Corps, earned his laurels before March 24th. First, with the murder of Marcus Osastinsky, who had been arrested in Cordoba, then with the death of Hugo Vaca Naveja, and another 50 prisoners through various merciless applications of the escape law. The official story of these deaths was told without any sense of shame. The murder of Dardo Coba, arrested in April 1975 and executed on January 6, 1977, with seven other prisoners under the jurisdiction of the 1st Army Corps, led by General Suarez Mason, shows that these instances do not constitute the indulgence of a few eccentric centurions, but rather are the very same policies that you plan among your general staff, that you discuss in your cabinet meetings, that you enforce as commanders-in-chief of the three branches of government, and that you approve as members of the ruling junta. Between 1,500 and 3,000 people have been massacred in secret since you banned the right to report the discovery of bodies. In some cases, the news still managed to leak, either because it involved other countries, or because of the magnitude of your genocide, or because of the shock provoked among your own troops. Twenty-five mutilated bodies washed up on Uruguayan shores between March and October of 1976. This was a small portion, perhaps, of the heaping number of those tortured to death at the Naval Mechanics Academy and dropped into the La Plata River by naval ships, among them a 15-year-old boy. Floril Avellaneda, his hands and feet bound with bruising in the anal region and visible fractures, according to the autopsy. In 1976, a local man went diving in the San Roque Lake, Cordoba, and discovered a genuine swamp of a cemetery. He went to the precinct, where they would not file his report, and he wrote the papers, where they would not publish it. Thirty-four bodies turned up in Buenos Aires between the 3rd and the 9th of April 1976, eight in San Telmo on July 4th, ten in the Lujan River on October 9th. This, plus the massacres on August 20th, left a heap of 30 people dead 15 kilometers from Campo de Mayo, and 17 dead in La Mas de Zamora are all part of the same pattern. 
These reports put an end to the make-believe story spun about right-wing gangs, alleged heirs of Lopez Rega's AAA, who would be able to get past the largest garrison in the country with military trucks, carpet the La Plata River with bodies, or throw prisoners to the sea from the 1st Aerial Brigade without General Videla, Admiral Macera, or Brigadier General Agosti knowing about it. Today, the AAA has become the three branches, and the junta you're running is not the balanced point between, quote, two kinds of violence, nor is it the impartial referee between, quote, two terrorisms. Rather, it is the very source of the terror that has lost its way and can do nothing more than babble on its discourse of death. The same historical continuity ties the murder of General Carlos Prats under the previous government, to the kidnapping and death of General Juan Jose Torres, Zelmar Michalini, Hector Gutierrez Ruiz, and dozens of political refugees whose death killed off any chance of democratic regimes in Chile, Bolivia, and Uruguay. That the Federal Police's Department of Foreign Affairs, which is led by officials who received grant money from the CIA via USAID, like Commissioners Juan Gate and Antonio Gator, and are themselves under the authority of Mr. Gardner Hathaway, station chief of the CIA in Argentina, was undeniably involved in those crimes, is the seed for future revelations like the ones that today shock the international community. The revelations will keep coming, even after a light is shined on the role that both the agency and high-ranking officers of the army, led by General Menendez, played in the creation of the Libertadores de America Society, the same society that replaced the AAA until the general mission was taken on by the Junta in the name of the three branches. This tally of destruction even includes the balancing of personal accounts, like the murder of Captain Horatio Gandera, who had been investigating the dealings of high-ranking naval chiefs for the past decade, or of the Prensa Libre journalist Horatio Novio, stabbed and burned to death after that paper reported on ties between Minister Martinez de Hoz and international monopolies. In the light of these incidents, the definition of the war, as phrased by one of its leaders, takes on its ultimate significance. Quote, the battle we are waging knows neither moral nor natural limits. It takes place beyond good and evil. End quote. These events, which have shaken the conscience of the civilized world, are nonetheless not the ones that have brought the greatest suffering upon the Argentine people, nor are they the worst human rights violation that you have committed. The political economy of the government is the place to look, not only for the explanation of your crimes, but also the even greater atrocity that is leading millions of human beings into certain misery. Over the course of one year, you have decreased the real wages of workers by 40%, reduced their contribution to the national income by 30%, and raised the number of hours per day a worker needs to put in to cover his cost of living from 6 to 18, thereby reviving forms of forced labor that cannot even be found in the last remnants of colonialism. By freezing salaries with the butts of your rifles while price rise at bayonet point, abolishing every form of collective protest, forbidding internal communications and assemblies, extending work days, raising unemployment to a record level of 9%, and being sure to increase it with 300,000 new layoffs, you have brought labor relations back to the beginning of the industrial era. And when the workers have wanted to protest, you have called them subversives and kidnapped their entire delegations of union representatives, who sometimes turned up dead and other times did not turn up at all. The results of these policies have been devastating. During this first year of government, consumption of food has decreased by 40%, consumption of clothing by more than 50%, and the consumption of medicine is practically at zero among the lower class. There are already regions in Greater Buenos Aires where the infant mortality rate is above 30%, a figure which places us on par with Rhodesia, Dahomey, or Guyana's. The incidence of diseases like summer diarrhea, parasitosis, and even rabies has climbed to meet world records and has even surpassed them. 
As if these were desirable and sought-after goals, you have reduced the public health budget to less than a third of military spending, shutting down even free hospitals while hundreds of doctors, medical professionals, and technicians join the exodus provoked by terror, low wages, or rationalization. You only have to walk around Greater Buenos Aires for a few hours before quickly realizing that these policies are turning it into a slum with 10 million inhabitants, cities in semi-darkness, entire neighborhoods with no running water because the monopolies rob them of their groundwater tables. Thousands of blocks turn into one big pothole because you only pave military neighborhoods and decorate the Plaza de Mayo. The biggest river in the world is contaminated in all its beaches because Minister Martinez de Jose's associates are sloughing their industrial waste into it, and the only government measure you have taken is to ban people from bathing. You have not been much wiser when it comes to the abstract goals of the economy, which you tend to call the country. A decrease in the gross national product of around 3%, a foreign debt reaches $600 per inhabitant, an annual inflation rate of 400%, a 9% increase in the money supply, within a single week in December, a low of 13% in foreign investment. These are also world records, strange fruit born of cold calculation and severe incompetence. While all constructive and protective functions of the state atrophy and dissolve into pure anemia, only one is clearly thriving, $1,800,000,000, the equivalent of half of Argentina's exports have been budgeted for security and defense in 1977. That there are 4,000 new officer positions in the federal police and 12,000 in the province of Buenos Aires, offering salaries that are double that of an industrial worker and triple that of a school principal, while military wages have secretly increased by 120% since February, proves that there is no salary freezing or unemployment in the kingdom of torture and death. This is the only Argentine business where the product is growing and where the price per slain gorilla is rising faster than the dollar. The economic policies of this junta, which follow the formula of the International Monetary Fund that has been applied indiscriminately to the Zaire and Chile, to Uruguay and Indonesia, recognize only the following as beneficiaries. The old rancher's oligarchy, the new speculating oligarchy, and a select group of international monopolies headed by ITT, ESSO, the automobile industry, U.S. Steel, and Siemens, which Minister Martinez de Hoz and his entire cabinet have personal ties to. A 722% increase in the prices of animal products in 1976 illustrates the scale of a return to oligarchy launched by Martinez de Haas that is consistent with the creed of Sociedad Rural, as stated by its president, Celedonio Pereira. Quote, it is very surprising that certain small but active groups keep insisting that food should be affordable. End quote. The spectacle of a stock exchange where within one week some have joined 100 and 200 percent gains without working, where there are companies that doubled their capital overnight without producing any more than before, where the crazy wheel of speculation spins in dollars, letters, adjustable values, and simple usury calculates interest on an hourly basis. It seems rather strange considering that this government came in to put a stop to the, quote, feast of the corrupt. By privatizing banks, you are placing the savings and credit of the country in the hands of foreign banks. By indemnifying ITT and Siemens, you are rewarding companies that swindle the state. By reinstalling fueling stations, you are raising shells and ESSO's returns. By lowering customs and tariffs, you are creating jobs in Hong Kong or Singapore and unemployment in Argentina. Faced with all these facts, you have to ask yourself, who are the unpatriotic people being referred to in the official press releases? Where are the mercenaries who are working for foreign interests? Which ideology is the one threatening the nation? Even if the overwhelming propaganda, a distorted reflection of the evil acts being committed, were not trying to argue that this junta wants peace, that General Videla is a defender of human rights, or that Admiral Macera loves life, 
it would still be worth asking the commanders-in-chief of the three branches to mediate on the abyss they are leading the country into under the pretense of winning a war. In this war, even killing the last guerrilla would do nothing more than make it start up again in new ways, because the reasons that have been motivating the Argentine people's resistance for more than 20 years will not disappear, but will instead be aggravated by the memory of the havoc that has been wreaked and by the revelation of the atrocities that have been committed. These are the thoughts I wanted to pass on to the members of this junta on the first anniversary of your ill-fated government, with no hope of being heard, with the certainty of being persecuted, but faithful to the commitment I made a long time ago to bear witness during difficult times.